Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. More than 700 years ago, the great Sufi poet Rumi penned one of the most enduring commentaries on the state of the world, comparing it to a reeling drunken body and saying that the caravan of civilization has been ambushed. With fools in charge everywhere, he called on true leaders to stand up and be the captains of their ships. Well, what does it take to navigate the dire straits of life, first as a world-class athlete and then as a world leader? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Prime Minister, it's great to see you, great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Now, I began with this somewhat verbose introduction, first because I know of your interest in Sufism and more importantly, because I think your whole life in politics and before that is a very colorful and I think very authentic illustration of following your heart's desires, which was very central to Rumi's teachings and the teachings of other uh, mystics. You're going to turn 70 this year. What keeps you powered? Uh, well, let me say one thing. Uh, when, a, when a human is born, uh, within him, he's trying to look for God. And this is a constant journey towards God. A lot of people, unfortunately, never ask the two questions. They never ask themselves, what is the purpose of existence? And what happens to me after I die? But whenever they ask these questions, it takes them towards God. The only way you have the answer to this question the purpose of ex existence, what happens to us when we die, is in religion. And all religions answer that question. Science doesn't. So the, the two ways of uh, existence, one is the spiritual and the other is the material. And uh, for me, if you are on the spiritual uh, road, then you will always be looking for how you can uh, face your God after you die that you have fulfilled your responsibility as a human being. And our responsibility as, as a human being is, the more God gives us, the more responsibility we have to lift, to help other human beings. Well, let's talk about this practical aspect of our lives, uh, helping other human beings and the state of the world, which uh, there are a lot of concerns uh, around the world about where it's moving, uh, many apocalyptic projections. Uh, I wonder how you feel about it and how do you feel about Pakistan's ability to adapt to this shifting landscape? Well, the world faces two huge challenges. One is climate change, where uh, the material existence, when we only live in this world for material well-being, then the classic example is how we um, imperil our own existence is what climate change is, how we have ravaged uh, the, the, the earth and how we have misused the blessings of God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so, so that is the biggest challenge, I think, for human beings, because uh, unless we do something, the world collectively does something, then we face, a, a, you know, we already are facing uh, issues uh, all over the world. Uh, this, the weather patterns and then the impact it's going to have on food security and so on. The second biggest challenge is the plunder of the developing world by the ruling elites of the developing world, where every year huge amounts of money, according to the factile channel uh, of the Secretary General of the UN, $1.5 trillion move from illegally. There's a trade imbalance anyway. I mean, the, trade, the money flows through the trade imbalance to the developed world anyway. But the illicit, the illegal, money laundered by the ruling elites, are over $1.5 trillion every year moves to the offshore accounts and Western capitals. Now, this is going to have severe consequences on food, on hunger, on starvation, on, on imbalance between the rich and the poor. And so I don't think enough attention is being paid to the second one, mm -hmm. because the, the richer countries benefit from it because they have this capital inflow, so they don't care. But, but the poor countries are getting destroyed. You, you don't get those profits, you know, after you finish your journey uh, in this world. So uh, 
at, the, at a certain point that, uh, that, that should come to an end. Now, I, I mentioned uh, Rumi and he wrote something to the effect that clever people want to change the world while wise people focus on themselves. And I wonder if the current predicament, including the ones that you talked about, climate change and uh, the plundering uh, of, um, of the human societies. Of the, of the uh, poor countries. Yeah, uh, if that is in a way a consequence of some clever people trying to make the world a better place because uh, all the plundering, all the uh, progress uh, has been done under seemingly positive slogans. The plunder is simple. The ruling elites, what they do is, uh, when they, as prime minister and me as a prime minister, if I want to take money out of, from Pakistan and my ministers, the only way I can do it is by destroying the institutions that will stop me from doing it. The judiciary, the accountability process, the, the tax department. So when I destroy the institutions, the country goes down. And this is why countries are poor. But what is happening is the rich countries are now building barriers. They are allowing the capital to come in, but they don't allow the labor to come in. They don't allow the unskilled labor to come in. So people are dying in the seas, they're you know, immigrants, and this will get worse. Uh, they're building walls. So the only way uh, to stop this people dying of hunger and poverty and this imbalance is for the rich countries to make laws like they have for drug money, like they have for terror financing. They should not allow, for instance, our ex-rulers have living in millions of dollars of properties in London. We can't do anything to get them back because the rich countries, they make it so difficult for get, let us get the money back. This should change because if really you want to stop this immigrant problem, poverty in the developing world, then there has to be a way that if, for instance, we say that, look, this person who was living in Pakistan has these huge properties in London, then, then unless that person can justify that he got this money legally, the property should be returned to us. That would stop the plunder of the developing world. Now, uh, let me switch gears a little bit because uh, we are recording this interview uh, on the eve of your visit to Russia uh, for a, a highly anticipated meeting between the heads of uh, our countries. Uh, countries uh, whose relationship for a very long time has been conditioned on others. It's been a function of uh, you know, other processes, regional, global processes. Do you think uh, Russia and Pakistan have reached that point when they can deal with one another as you know, self-sufficient actors on a bilateral basis rather than, let's say, looking onto others? Well, uh, let me just go back in history. Uh, when the Cold War was, uh, you know, ravaging the whole of the, the world, the world was divided into blocks. Pakistan moved in with the United States. We became part of the bloc in the Cold War with the US. India actually stayed neutral, but it was very close to the Soviets. Uh, now, when I look back, I think initially Pakistan needed help because of when we became independent, we were impoverished. There were millions of refugees in Pakistan. We needed help. But, you know, beyond uh, 10 years or so, we should have then uh, been non-aligned, independent country, uh, st stood on our own feet, not relied on aid. We became part of a bloc because we got foreign aid. When you look back, foreign aid is a curse for a country because you do not fix your own systems. You do not raise your own revenues. You don't increase your exports. You rely on handouts and it stops a country evolving and developing and becoming self-reliant. So the, the world being divided into Cold War blocks and Pakistan becoming part of a block, when you look back, uh, it stopped us from developing as a country. Well, you cannot go back, but you can change things moving forward. So do so, you think at so, this point? So when you, but you, you know, you learn from history. You learn from your mistakes. Well, uh, you ha have to know how to take the knocks. I, I guess that's your motto in life, right? You cannot uh, move forward in life until you learn from your mistakes. So now what we want to do is not become part of any block. We want to have trading relationships with all countries. We have suffered. Uh, India 
became a hostile country, so the trade between them was minimal. Iran had sanctions, so we couldn't trade on the west side. Afghanistan has 40 years of conflict, so we couldn't go north and then to Central Asia. We couldn't go to Central Asia because we became part of the US bloc and Central Asia was part of the, uh, the Soviet bloc. So what we want now is trade with everyone. And what is the purpose behind it? To raise our people out of poverty. That is the main, any head of state, his main uh, focus should be, how do you raise people out, out of poverty? And, if you, and the best way is trading with everyone. And trading, regions develop. Now, our region has been left behind uh, because, sadly, uh, there's hardly any trading uh, with the neighbors. But, uh, Prime Minister, intention to trade is uh, perhaps not enough because, uh, as you know, our countries for quite some time have been discussing a large infrastructure project. Uh, I think it's called the Pakistan Stream, uh, a gas pipeline. But uh, forgive me my pun, uh, uh, pun the, the stream hasn't gotten enough steam yet and now in addition to logistical financing challenges uh, we are also dealing i mean moscow is dealing with a threat of arbitrary sanctions western sanctions uh, that could be imposed on any uh, russia associated project do you think this project and others uh, will be up and running in our lifetime because uh, sure you are free uh, technically speaking you are free to trade with everyone but you know how geopolitics works and there are some subtle ways of uh, imposing pressure on international partners. That's true. I mean, uh, this uh, North-South pipeline, one of the reasons that suffered was the companies that, uh, that we were negotiating with turned out that the US had applied sanctions on them. So, so the problem was uh, to get a company that wasn't sanctioned, a, a Russian company that wasn't sanctioned. So that became a problem uh, with Iran. We, we could, uh, we are gas deficient right now. We could just gas pipeline from Iran, but Iran is sanctioned. I have to say that the developing world really uh, wishes that there is not another Cold War. Because, you know, how do we go ahead? Our purpose is not that we become part of any bloc. Our, my main purpose is we have almost half our population, the bottom 50%, half is above poverty line and half is below. But if, there, if, if there's a, like this commodity super cycle when commodity prices have gone up, or if there's a shock like the COVID-19, then they start going below the poverty line. So the last thing we want is the world divided into blocks, sanctions, and I'm hoping that uh, this U Ukraine crisis is resolved uh, peacefully. But do you think this pipeline will be up and running uh, while well, we have, now we have been working on it with the Russian counterparts. And I think we have got very close now to signing the agreement. Well, good luck with that. You mentioned the uh, Ukrainian crisis. And if we read reports in Western media, uh, there is an imminent war between Russia and Ukraine on the cards. Uh, and uh, clearly, Western countries take a very oppositional, I would even say uh, anemical view to Russia. For a shrewd politician like yourself, don't you think that it's perhaps too precarious of a time to expand Pakistan's geopolitical horizons? Well, firstly, this doesn't concern us. I mean, you know, we have a bilateral relationship with Russia. We really want to strengthen it. You know, as I said, regions develop. It's not countries don't develop in isolation. It's because a whole region uh, goes up. Like we saw the European Union. I mean, I was in university in England when the European Union uh, came into being. And then the whole area standard of living went up. So we want to sort of really, we hope that you know, sanctions are lifted on Iran so that you know, we, we are short of gas here. And you know, with Iran, it's the cheapest gas we can get. And similarly, we hope that India one day, I mean, Indian leadership, I wish they would concentrate on raising people out of poverty in India rather than proving to the world that the Hindus are the most superior race. I mean, their leadership, how can a, a leadership not worry about having the most, the, the highest poverty in the world is in the Indian subcontinent? How could they not worry about it rather than trying to prove to the world that the Hindus are superior? Well, so, but the Prime Minister, on the other hand, uh, many nations go through such period. I mean, it could be a, a 
more or less painful uh, historically, but uh, you know the the spell of nationalism uh, has affected many uh, countries historically. Now uh, you mentioned that you don't want to uh, play camp politics anymore. You want to be a bridge. And uh, this is a very admirable goal, uh, also a very beautiful metaphor. I think Turkey or even Ukraine uh, framed their foreign policy in such terms uh, a few years back, but they were disappointed. What makes you believe that Pakistan can actually pull it off, being this bridge? Let's say in Eurasia, when so many other countries attempted it and failed. Well, firstly, l let me just say one thing. As a student of history, I do not believe that military conflicts solve problems. I believe they give uh, rise to so many other problems. You go in to solve one problem, supposedly the US went into Iraq uh, to, to fight Al-Qaeda, but in the end ISIS came into being. If you look back, I mean, look at the conflict since 9-11. I mean, if a, a third party dispassionately did a proper analysis of so many people killed, what was achieved at the end? What, what happened in Afghanistan? 20 years of God knows hundreds and thousands of people dying. What was the achievement? So therefore, I'm not a believer in military conflicts. I believe the civilized societies resolve the difference through dialogue. And the countries that rely on military conflict have not studied history properly. Well, they have not studied history properly and they haven't faced any accountability because uh, in this day and age, power still, uh, you know, decides what has to be done. Uh, do you believe uh, on a personal or let's say on a political level, in some sense of accountability, maybe historical accountability, do you think things will change in the world so that all the great aspirations that you have uh, could be uh, realized without uh, as getting very cynical, because uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying on an emotional level, but I have covered so many wars and I have seen so many people killed absolutely for nothing that I, I, I simply don't believe that uh, Western leaders care about uh, things like human lives or even development in, de in the developing countries. I'm sorry for saying that. It's true. Uh, most leaders, uh, the, the main concern is to stay in power. So if to stay in power, you know, there's a, what they call is, is a good war, they, will, they, will, they won't mind the loss of uh, human lives oh, as long as... It's collateral damage, it's not, it's not people. It's collateral exactly, damage. I mean, uh, you know, as someone who looks upon the world from a spiritual point of view, I think it is insane to have a conflict with the idea of people dying and thinking that you will get more popular because of that. I think throughout history, you know, human beings have done this. Supposedly great leaders came in and caused death and destruction. So I believe, for instance, take this Ukraine uh, conflict. I mean, for the life of mine, I, I cannot really believe that they will, they, there is any chance, there's any possibility of a conflict because the consequences Forget about what will happen to the combatants. For the developing world, already the price of uh, oil has gone up because of, of the prospect of a, of a conflict. Ukraine supplies wheat to the world, uh, and for, for that matter, Russia. Now imagine what will happen. Already the world is suffering from the after effects of the COVID-19. Imagine if there's a conflict. What will happen to the poor countries? Already the poor countries are suffering. They are already in debt because they had to incur debt because of the consequences of the COVID-19 fallout. So I cannot in my mind understand how will, I mean, how can they even have got this close of, to a conflict? I can't understand this. We were talking about the Ukrainian conflict and obviously we, the Russians and our Ukrainian neighbors are very affected, but uh, you have a, your own conflict to solve. And, uh, it may be a very stupid question on my part, but uh, because we all know that, you know, bad peace is better than a good war, but still, historically, do you think it's better to leave a conflict in a limbo for decades uh, on end? Or do you think issues should be solved when they're hot? You see, if, if humans want they can solve any conflict. 
The problem is that the humans, the leaders, and I'm talking about the leaders, I'm sure in, uh, people in Ukraine and in the Russia, everyone understands that if there's a conflict, there will be consequences. Everyone will be worse. It's not about the people. People on, on either side don't want this conflict to so, happen. So, so exactly. But I think that the leadership in the countries is then stuck that if we withdraw from this position, what will be the consequences to us politically? Because politically, there are consequences always. And I think it takes very powerful, great leaders who rise above this and who, look, who think about the effects on the human beings. I, I do want to ask you about great leadership, but uh, very quickly, uh, I know that you have tried to deal with your mutual grievances uh, with India over Kashmir, and I'm sure you're not satisfied with the, with the results of those efforts. Um, are you going to leave that issue to your successors, or are you still uh, hoping to try something new? Do you know, when, uh, when my party came into power uh, in 2018, first thing I did was to reach out to India. And I told them, you know, our only issue is Kashmir. Let's sit down on the table and resolve it. Let's have a roadmap. But I didn't realize, you know, and remember, I'm the one who knows India better than anyone because cricket is a passion, you know, in the subcontinent. And because of, uh, you know, me being captain of cricket here and sort of playing lots of, over 10 years against India, uh, I know India better than most people. I know the, the, the senior journalists, their politicians, their, their uh, uh, sports people. So I'm, I know them, India very well. So I immediately reached out. But then I discovered, to my horror, that this is not the India I used to know. Because it's been taken over by this mad ideology. It's a racist ideology, which was, which was inspired by the Nazis. The founding fathers were inspired by the Nazis. You can Google on your phone and you can, uh, the, 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 the founding fathers praised the Nazis. Racial superiority, hatred towards the Muslims, towards the Christians. Because, and they look back some thousand years how Hinduism was the superior religion and culture. And you see, there's a negative uh, nationalism, there's a positive nationalism. You must distinguish between the two. I can inspire my people by saying, look, you were a great nation, let's now get back again. But if I say you were a great nation, but because of these other human communities, you could not reach the top, so shift the hatred towards them, there is always bloodshed. Prime Minister, I'm sure your counterpart in New Delhi would disagree, but if uh, Prime Minister Modi wants to sh share his own views, we would be more than uh, happy to travel to New Delhi I, and I, interview him I, on listen, that very... Listen, I would love to debate with Narendra Modi on TV. That would I would be love great. to talk. But you know, uh, before we organize this debate, and by the way, RT would be happy to moderate it, me personally, but I have an editor it who... Would be, it would be so good for over a billion people on the subcontinent if we can resolve our differences through a debate rather than Friends, through... That would be amazing. But before we go there, I have uh, an editor who is a huge cricket fan. And he follows cricket uh, and obviously your fate also very, very closely. And he, he told me that um, your team haven't uh, toured India since 2013, while uh, the Indian team hasn't been to Pakistan since 2006. Is there any chance... Uh, that's his question. Is there any chance of restarting bilateral cricket tours as a way of rebuilding ties and as a way of rekindling that passion? Because if you have a common passion, there's something common inside of you. We are all humans deep down. I mean, we are all the same. So, you know, both the hatreds and the loves, they, they, they are shared. Do you think well, there's uh, something, do you think cricket can be a saving Well, cricket? we just played India a few months back. And uh, I have to say, uh, the celebrations that took place in Pakistan when they beat India in the 2020 World Cup. Uh, you know, I haven't seen people so happy for a while. But, but unfortunately, sports is connected to politics, no matter how much we try and separate it. Now, what the India has done in Kashmir, it has unilaterally revoked its status, which was a special status, since 75 years. Uh, guaranteed the, you know, the, the United Nations Security Council guaranteed the people of Kashmir the right to self-determination. 
So through their own democratic right, they could decide whether they wanted to be Pakistan or India. When they revoked that right, and that was uh, 5th August uh, 2018, that's when unfortunately things have got worse. Now, if we try to pretend everything is normal, it means Pakistan has abandoned the people of Kashmir. So therefore, you know, uh, we played in a third, uh, uh, third country like, uh, you know, this, this uh, World Cup. But bilateral uh, ties, I think, will have to wait till there's some sort of a breakthrough here. Mm -hmm. now let me ask specifically about Pakistan, because this year marks the 75th anniversary of your country coming into being, and uh, the, the figure of Muhammad Ali Jinnah still looms large with his philosophy of marrying modernity with uh, traditional grassroots culture. And I think it's not only in Pakistan, but I see uh, this philosophy coming to prominence all around the world, even in Russia, I think. Uh, Vladimir Putin subscribes to a similar brand of enlightened conservatism. When you see uh, progressive things around the world, you benefit from them, but you stay true to your sort of your inner core, your collective soul. Mm -hmm. Why do you think um, it's becoming so popular around the world? Because, so bec because whenever you try and superimpose another culture on a, on a nation, it doesn't work. You know, colonialism, what did it do? What the colonialists created was a thin lot of people who imitated the colonialists, who in Pakistan would be called the westernized elite. But there was a big gap between them and the rest of the population. So uh, nations evolve organically. They borrow from all over the world, but they, they are rooted in their own culture and history. If you cut that off, I mean, it has severe consequences all over the world. When you cut off a country from its roots, a, a nation, and try and ape another culture, mm -hmm. they become neither one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. In Urdu, we say neither teeter or a bater, neither quail or a partridge. So it, it's very important that uh, the countries stay rooted in their own history and culture, and that's how countries evolve as a whole. Mm -hmm. What has happened after colonialism is that you have a tiny set of elite which pretends that they are that they're Western, and the gap between them and the rest becomes wider and wider. It's what happened in Iran. The Iranian revolution was that the elite of the Shah of Iran became cut off from the ma mass of the population. So there was a huge reaction against it. In Pakistan, what we are trying to do is obviously learn from all advanced societies, and right now, the, the, the nation we can learn most from is China, because if my main emphasis is to raise people out of poverty, no human society has achieved what China has done. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we learn from everyone, but we should be rooted in our own culture, history, religion. Mm -hmm. Now, since you mentioned China, uh, China played uh, a subtle, but uh, I think very significant role in facilitating Russian-Pakistani exchanges, and uh, I know that Recently, while visiting Beijing, you suggested that Islamabad can act as a mediator between Beijing and uh, Washington. What makes you believe, I'm sorry for being blunt, but what makes you believe that mediation is even possible? Because as far as uh, I understand the American psyche, they are not after understanding, they are not after negotiating on the level playing field, they are after preserving dominance. Would China agree to that? But look, the America uh, I know is very diverse. Any country, for instance, what is happening in India is not what Indians are like. This is not the India of, uh, of Nehru and Gandhi. This is the India of Narendra Modi. A tiny, highly organized elite has taken over India, just like the Nazis took over Germany. So, you know, at a given point, there is this extreme nationalism which has been released in the US, and they want this dominance. Mm -hmm. But surely there are sensible voices in the U.S. saying that conflict is where you are heading. Conflict, Cold War is not the way. There is another way where it could be win and win for everyone. And I certainly believe that the cooperation between China and the United States, and even for that matter Russia, will benefit mankind much more than a conflict. I wish I had more time, I have many more questions, but let me ask the final one. Um, and it's a bit cheesy, but I, I ask it sincerely because you've reached the pinnacle of your sporting career by 
giving your country its first and only victory in the Cricket World Cup. How do you hope to be remembered? What do you want to give to your people as, uh, as a prime minister? That's a simple answer. I would love to emulate China in terms of bringing people out of poverty. Two things I want. One thing is if I can bring people out of poverty, but related to that is rule of law. You see, problem with poor countries, developing world is they don't have rule of law. That's why they're poor countries. But even developed world doesn't have the rule of law. They have the international law for everybody else, but not for themselves. Yeah, there are two different things. There's the rule of law within the country, and then rule of law between countries. That doesn't exist. The powerful always want to be above law. But within the countries, countries only prosper when they have rule of law. The, the third world or banana, the term banana republic is, is not because a country is poor because of lack of resources. They don't have rule of law. They have law of the jungle. So human societies are defined by two great things, rule of law and a welfare society, a society that is humane and just and looks after its, its uh, people who are not so privileged, who are poor. And so that's how I want to be looked, uh, remembered. If I can bring rule of law in Pakistan and raise our people out of poverty on the lines what China has done, mm. uh, I would be able to meet my maker with confidence. Well, best of luck, I'm sure. I mean, you, you followed all your dreams throughout your life, so it seems like you're on the, on the yeah, road. I have, I, I, I'm one of those few privileged people who whatever he asked from the Almighty, he got it. And this is my last wish that, you know, if I can succeed in, in, because I believe that if you have rule of law and if you can bring people out of poverty and look after a human society, then you don't have to do, the society goes up then. You know, a nation rises when it rises inclusively. It doesn't rise when a tiny people keep getting richer and the rest are left behind. It rises what China has done. You see, China is remarkable. In fact, what China has done is what our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, he built the first society uh, in the seventh century. And that society had these two things, rule of law, and it was the first welfare state in the history of mankind. And they became the greatest civilization for hundreds of years. Can I ask you one last question? Because you, you mentioned the Almighty, and I've been uh, an observer of global politics for quite some time to believe that any leader can succeed with the help, uh, can only succeed with the help of a higher spirit, whatever we call it. I mean, it, the, you know, we have many religions, but at the end of the day, the spirit is uh, one and only. And that force, that higher force demands of you being true to yourself, being true to the cause that you are serving, but politics is such a field uh, that uh, is impossible to operate in without manipulation. How do you balance this need to be effective, if you will, and to be uh, true to, to the power that powers you? Very simple. You, you compromise to reach your objective. You never compromise on the objective itself. So as long as I can I make all the compromises, to get to where I'm, I'm very clear, I explained to you, rule of law and welfare state. But if I find that I have to compromise where my objective is going to be affected, then I don't compromise. Well, Prime Minister, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. I hope your team receives as much hospitality as we've benefited from here. Best of luck I'm in Moscow and best of luck in, for I'm your I'm looking endeavors. forward to my trip to Moscow. Thank you.